Okay, so uh, here we are, last session of Taste and See. And I'm just going to do a quick recap just so you guys can remember what we've gone through so far. Uh, again, we've talked about vision, right? The importance of having a clear vision and why that matters to have a final destination that you're trying to aim for because everything else kind of trickles down below that. And that's how you make ultimate decisions. Uh, we talked about um, mission and what mission is. And really, this is a strategic level thing uh, when you think about mission in terms of the way we define it and having very specific objectives and specific things tactically that you're trying to do to get to the mission, right? Because that is the that is the how, right? The vision is the what, okay? So I know we talked about you know, how do you guys interview a business person, went through a strategy assignment, uh, we went through core convictions. If you guys remember that, that's a huge part of what we do. In fact, I went through a core conviction today with uh, our guys here this morning and the sales team, uh, really discussing this notion of 70% and then go uh, and why that's so important for us. Um, how do you guys share some of your convictions, interview some friends that you guys did? I think you learned some fun things with that. Uh, we talked about why, should we have a why? And that that's really important to give you fuel. You know, if you don't have a why of what you're doing, then you're going to get very confused and disillusioned. If you don't know why is it that I'm doing this, what continues to get me up every morning and driving me to that ultimate vision and mission uh, so that I can have success. Went through Simon Sinek um, and what that really means. DNA of a company who thrives at Integrity Capital, uh, celebrating teammates. So how'd you guys go through and do celebrations for some of your friends and saying thank you. That is a big, big part of life. It's something that we do here on a consistent basis of being thankful and sending cards and just letting each other know why we appreciate them and that we do appreciate them. And I think Mackie will attest that it's nice to be appreciated <laughs> when you work somewhere. Um, and then uh, celebrating teammates, uh, uh, verbally doing that. Uh, innovation, you guys went through, did that awesome assignment, uh, which was so fun to see you go through that. I gave you guys some feedback on that, some things you did amazing, and some things I'd like you guys to work on in the future as you do presentations. So those are just some feedback things that you guys can take or toss but uh, hopefully some things that will give you uh, a little edge as you go forward uh, as well. And, um, you know, just going through the industry overview, understanding how big the industry is. It's a big, big industry, trillions of dollars. Uh, so you'll never uh, go without doing business. There's plenty to go around uh, in a trillion dollar plus industry as well. Did some research projects, talked about commercial banks, what they really are, how they function. Um, we talked about life insurance companies the last time we chatted. And uh, obviously there's some trickiness to that. Uh, and then today we're gonna talk about CMBS, okay? We're gonna talk about CMBS, which is a tricky thing. And we're gonna talk about hard money lenders and we're gonna talk about bridge lenders and then some third party reports as well. And then what somebody's role is there. So CMBS, it's uh, commercial mortgage backed securities. Okay. Uh, this was an industry that kind of popped up back in the 80s, 90s, when uh, some high fluting guys started to figure out oh my gosh, we could take all of these instruments and securitize them and put them in these. So when you think about a commercial mortgage-backed security, I want you to think about different parties, okay? You've got the, uh, the you've got the borrower, right? And then the borrower is gonna come to who would be sort of that underwriter or the one who is what I would call table funding the deal. And I'll talk to you about what table funding means here in a minute. So you have this, this group like a, a Merrill Lynch, um, you know, or Bear Stearns when they were sort of around, uh, UBS, 
you know, so these are larger financial institutions who have the balance sheets uh, to be able to pull this off. And what they are is this ginormous, what I call pass-through table funding institution. So what that means is they will take this loan. So if somebody comes in and says, I want to do a $50 million loan, they will go ahead and underwrite everything, prepare it. And the reason they're a pass-through is because there's these other people behind the scenes, which are called BP spires, as well as kind of tranche buyers that they'll like life insurance companies, pension funds, uh, these big institutions that like to buy these instruments. So think about the life companies we talked about before. The life companies are just these big money managers. So like, well, we wanna buy corporate bonds or we might do some commercial mortgages and you know, we might invest in stocks, but then they look and say, well, we could also buy CMBS paper, okay? So what happens is they take all these loans and they put it in this huge, what they call tranche, okay? And then what they'll do is they'll classify levels of cash flow based upon what they consider risk rating. Okay, so they'll have the, uh, you know, Moody's, uh, S&P will come, <clears throat> come in and they'll say, hey, we're gonna rate <clears throat> your bucket of loans uh, based upon the collateral, right? What is the asset type? So if it's a hotel, do you think that's gonna have a more tricky uh, rating than like an apartment complex, right? And the answer is yes, because hotels are considered riskier than a apartment complex, okay? And so all they're doing, if you guys think in simplistic terms, Everything having to do with this world has to do with risk, 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 risk adjusted returns. So they're always saying, well, you're putting down 50% versus 25%. So do you think that the guy who's doing a 50% loan is riskier than the person doing the 75% loan or less risky? Less, because he's putting down more. He's putting down more money. So if I'm putting more cash down, okay, that means that there's less loan, which means there's more equity, okay? So by nature, that's less risky, right? Versus if I did an 80% loan, now I have a 20% of my equity into it, that's more risky. And the reason why is because if something goes burpy and, and the market shifts and that market uh, valuation drops, okay, below 20%, then guess what just happened to my loan? The loan is upside down now, okay? So all of a sudden my loan is exceeding the value, which is exactly what happened in 2008, okay? Where they lent high, high, high on the loans, on the properties, values plummeted, loans stayed the same, and now you have this negative arbitrage, right? All of a sudden you have a loan that's higher than the value. That's not good. So what they do is they're going to look at all these variables, interest rate, loan to value, geographic location, um, you know, what type of asset it is, um, who the tenants are. Okay. So they take all these different factors and they're going to rate them. And they're going to say, we think this is triple B rated or triple B minus or triple B plus or triple, you know, AAB. You know, they have all these different levels. And as you get higher on the, you know, it's triple A plus, that's the best, right? And then you start going down uh, the list. And so if I am a buyer of those cash flow papers, okay, I'm looking at that and saying, the more risk that of that particular rating, then what do you think is going to happen to the uh, price that I'm going to pay for that particular tranche of loans? Do you think it is higher or lower? So do you say the, the higher the rating? Higher the risk. Or the higher the risk. So the higher the risk, so the lower the rating, 
What do you think is going to happen if I'm the person buying that? Wouldn't that be cheaper? Yeah, lower price. Cheaper. Yeah, it's lower. So I'm paying less, which means that the return that I'm getting is what? High. It's higher. Okay. So um, just think of it in terms of if I came to you, Rimson, I said, Okay, uh, you can buy a Walgreens property in downtown Scottsdale, Arizona, or you can buy Joe's, you know, Crab Shack in the middle of Midland, Texas, in the middle of nowhere, right? And what's going to happen is you're going to say, well, what is the return I'm going to get on the one there? And I say, well, it's, you know, 7% <clears throat> in the Midland, and it's 6% in there, and you're going to go, why would I pay 7%? It just doesn't seem commensurate with the risk I'm taking, right? I'd have to get 15%, you know, because I just, I'm in a smaller town. It's not a credit tenant like a Walgreens, right? I'm not going to pay that kind of price, okay? So what you're all, they're doing the same thing. These, these guys and gals are coming in and they're saying, hey, you know, and by the way, this changes every day. So if all of a sudden the COVID, think about when COVID came in, so all of a sudden COVID came and these guys were ready to sell these huge tranches of loan. They just got raided by the agencies. And all of a sudden these people came in and said, well, I'm not paying that price. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. And if you want me to buy this, I'm not going to pay you this price. I'm going to pay you like 20% lower, right? And so all of a sudden you can kind of see this weird thing happen where if I'm the person who's going to book those loans, guess what I'm doing every single day? I'm talking to these guys every day. Hey, what's going on? This is what we're thinking of doing. What do you think of this? Da, 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 da. So I'm essentially pre-selling this thing before I'm funding it, right? I'm trying to get a feel for these buyers, okay, every single day with the intention, hopefully, that I'll close and by the time 60 to 90 days comes up, when I have this huge bucket of loan comes from the time I close to the time I sell, hopefully <laughs> nothing crazy happens in the market. Okay. That's your risk because all of a sudden the market could go wacky and you just got stuck with, you know, a billion dollars worth of loans that you're like, crap, what am I going to do? Um, because you're not in the business of portfolioing and balance sheeting these loans. You're in the business of booking them and selling them so you can make the arbitrage or the spread, okay? So if all of a sudden I have this bucket of loans that I booked for 100, I'm just using these numbers, and I'm gonna sell them for 101, okay? So I wanna make the spread between the 100 and the 101 that I'm going to make. But if all of a sudden I book them for 100 and now they're going to only sell for 99, I'm guess what's happening? I, am I making money? No, I'm losing money. <laughs> okay? And so I'm like, oh crap. Like I just booked a, you know, half a billion dollars worth of loans and I can't afford to sell it. So guess what they do? They hold on to them, okay? And they're gonna have to make the money on the coupons, which is fine, but they're stuck with this money because guess what? They borrow money to go book those loans. Do you see, see how that works? So they borrow money from a bank that they use to fund these loans, okay? So they're not really in the business of having that all cash, okay? So are you guys tracking with me so far? Have I confused the living daylights out of you guys? <laughs> I am confused. <laughs> okay, all right, good. Not good, but I'll I'll tell okay. me which portion is confusing. Okay, the portion for me. Okay, uh, the confusion. With, so I'll just uh, go through the process that I understood. Okay, yeah, sure. so what yeah. happens is um, 
there are like life insurance companies and all of these who are actually looking for loans, right? So they need money. So they come to someone like, uh, for example, like UBS and all like uh, Merrill Lynch and all of them and ask for the funding. So they take the, they give them the loan and create a kind of ETF for all of these people that is loan based kind of based on the ratings they have gotten. And then after that, they sell these loans to the other party, to the people who, who is the one they are selling this loan to? Life companies. But I thought life companies were the one that were taking the <laughs> So So this is where it's a little tricky. Okay. Yeah. Life insurance companies in of themselves can go and lend money to borrowers. Okay. Uh, and they do. Kind of like we talked about before. But remember, life insurance companies are in the business of investing money, okay? So they could go do their own commercial mortgages or they could buy these security instruments because that's what they are. They're not a loan. I mean, they are a loan, but they're buying it as a security. So they're just getting a coupon every month from these things based on the yield that someone else has securitized and sold off as security, just like if you went and bought a, a bond, okay? okay? So, or a corporate bond, it's the same type of thing. It's just, it's just packaged the same, but it's a different instrument, meaning that corporate bonds are against the company. These are against commercial real estate, just like securities against residential homes, right? When you go get a home loan, you're going to do it probably through a big bank. And then guess what they're going to do? You're going to, they're going to sell it. And you're going to have this, you're going to go, wait a minute, I just did a loan with Wells Fargo. Why do I have a, a, a statement from this company I've never heard of before? And the reason why is because they put it in a huge pool and they sell it. And then this company you've never heard of bought them. And then you're, you're paying them because they own the loan. Okay, so the life insurance company or pension funds or ginormous mutual funds just look at these as another way to invest their money. Okay, so again, you have borrower over here who's going to borrow the money. UBS, they're the middleman. Just think of the middleman. Okay. And then you have life company slash pension slash mutual fund, right? And all they're doing is they're behind the scenes investors and depending upon their risk level, that's why they call them B, there's B piece buyers who will take the, the highest risk of, of the tranche. And they'll say, well, we'll buy the highest portion of this, uh, uh, you know, pool, but we want to get like 15% on our money. Okay. Where a life company might say, no, no, no. I, I will only buy like, you know, triple A stuff and we don't mind getting, you know, 5% or whatever it is. Right. But we just don't want the risk because we can't afford it. Okay. So you have these different layers of buyers behind the scenes that are investors just looking to make a yield. And just like we're seeing right now, um, the market's wonky because the treasuries right now, prime rate went up to seven and a half. It was all the way down to like two. And now it's seven and a half. And so all these rates have gone high and if I'm a life company, I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I just talked to my financial planner today. He's like, you can go make 4%, just putting it in the money market. It's like, it's crazy. Uh, you know, and and so now these guys can say, well, gosh, I can go make six or seven percent. And I and I and so why would I go ahead and lend money out? So you're in this kind of weird state now where there people are just there, there have lots of options to make better yield. And they're waiting. Okay. So the CMBS market right now is completely out of whack. Okay. Because it doesn't do well when the market is all in turmoil. COVID happened, went out of whack. 9 11 happened, went out of whack. 
I mean, anytime there's turmoil, CMBS just gets, it's not good because the buyers are like, well, I'm not going to pay that price. Okay. Um, we personally don't like CMBS for that exact reason, because you could go all the way down the road, get to the end and all of a sudden the market shifts and they'll either come back and say, oh, sorry, we're not doing your loan or, oh, hey, sorry, uh, that, that rate we gave you just went up like 200 basis points. You're like, what? You're crazy. And I've had those conversations. It's not fun. And so we just opted to be like, we're not going to play in that space anymore. Okay. And I've done a ton of it. So does that, does that help a little bit more? I want to make sure you're understanding it because I don't want to just scooch on if you don't. Yeah, I understand a little bit more for sure. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, how about the rest of you guys? Are you... Is this, because again, I appreciate the honesty, Rimsa. I want you guys to get it, uh, not perfectly, but I want you to understand the, the general concept because it's helpful uh, because who knows, maybe one day I talk to you guys and you're working at a CMBS company. You know, uh, and you go, that's cool. I like that, you know. Uh, but, you know, so any other questions or comments I'm giving you very high level stuff and I, and I'll drill more down into the details, but um, I'm going to stop right there and, and leave it open for questions, comments, confusions, which is totally fine. As I mentioned before, none of this bothers me. And uh, I had a, I, I had a quick question. Um, so I understand the general concept, but when the C, like when the original lender, so like a Merrill Lynch creates the tranches or the securities, how do they make money off of the life insurance companies when they buy the securities or do yeah. they just need it? It's a great question. It's all based upon the arbitrage. Okay. So I used, when I started in this business, I bought and sold loans from banks. Okay. That's how I got in the industry. I was buying and selling loans for maybe an Amro. And then, so what I would do, I'll give you an example. So I would come into the bank and I would say, let's say they had a uh, hundred million dollars, okay? That they wanted to sell. And the reason they wanted to sell is because they need liquidity, okay? It's not like they were distressed, but they were like, we need cash. So they were like, we need, so we can do more loans. So we would come in and I'd say, okay, I will pay you par or I will pay you exactly what it is that you're, you have. So 100 million you have, I'll pay you 100 million, okay? So I would buy that 100 million dollars and what I would do before I bought it is I would go to the bank over in Beverly Hills and I'd say to him or her, hey, you need loans really bad and you got a ton of cash. So I will sell these to you, not for 100 million, but I'll sell it to you for 110 million or 105 million, whatever it was that I felt like I could get. Okay. So then I would turn around, pre him, pre sold it, and then close simultaneously, having bought it for 100 and sold it to them for 105 and made the, you know, 5 million or whatever it is, 10 million bucks. Okay. So it's no different where the CMBS is booking all these loans at par with a certain rate, okay, a certain coupon or a spread. So they're going to say, hey, we're charging 350 over the 10-year swap, okay? And so what they would do is they knew by pricing it that specific way that if they sold it for, so if they booked it at 300 over the 10-year swap, then they could go ahead and sell it, you know, for a certain amount that was, you know, higher uh, so that that person, or I would say lower, so that person could make a yield or a spread. Okay, so they were going to be here, they would sell it for this, and then they would make the spread between those specific yields. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So great, great question. Because they're again, they're in the business. These aren't uh, nonprofits. <laughs> they're they're wanting to make money, and they do make a lot of money. So that's that's why it's very risky. 
but they can make a ton of money. And so, and they have, I mean, it's a very lucrative business unless you just get caught with your pants down and just the market goes crazy. And it's like, oh my gosh, I, you know, now we're in big trouble. Okay. That's what happened with Bear Stearns. They just started lending high, high levels and they got all of a sudden way up on the stack and it just was crazy. People were lending money. That's why it got out of control. People were just securitizing these loans, not realizing that they were lending money to people who had no right <laughs> to be borrowing money at all. And uh, so it just became a, a big problem. And the rating agencies were not doing a good job. And so it just became a mess. So uh, so yeah, so good good question. What other questions? Any, any other questions, comments uh, about it? I wanted to ask slash comment when I was like, watching it it reminded me a lot of uh the big short the movie yeah the big short yeah. how accurate is the depiction in that to kind of this process because obviously there's some nuances and in, in yeah. how you did it but i think there's a lot of similarities meaning that you know that the but a lot has changed because you know because of that uh the the regulatory elements of it have gone up dramatically uh, so that, you know, so the foolishness can't really happen anymore. You know, the reason why that became such a problem was because it was newer. Right. And that just always opens up a lot of potentials for, for fraud. But um, you just didn't really have a lot of regulatory agencies because they didn't know what to regulate. It was just a new thing. But the rating agencies were rating these things one way. They were getting paid to do it. So there was kind of this corruption going on. And then they really shouldn't have been rating. So people were paying a price of something that should have been lower risk, but it really wasn't. And so now the ratings have changed dramatically uh, and it's very scrutinized. And so it's very rare if that can happen at all. Uh, and, um, you know, plus, People were lending money on stuff that was so stupid. I mean, I saw it. I mean, I they would come in and say, "Oh, you've got a, a you know, three thousand units in New York, and uh, you know, your your leases are this. Well, we're gonna uh, at twenty bucks a foot, but we're gonna lend to you as if the leases were forty bucks a foot because that's what we think you're gonna get." in the future, you know, you're going to be able to lease these things up and clean them up. And so they were lending based upon future income. Okay. Uh, and so they were underwriting as if, as if, as if it would already happen and it hasn't, it was, they were going to have to achieve those rents and uh, cause they had vacancy or they thought the rents were low or whatever. So you could see where that becomes a real problem because if you're using higher rents, your, your value is higher, but in actuality, that's, you know, if you don't get them, then I just lent you on ghost value. I mean, it's like, well, that's not really worth anything. Uh, and so all of a sudden when the market crashed and tumbled, I mean, rate, you know, just absolutely plummeted everything. Uh, and it was just this domino effect that nobody could stop. So, and again, it was just because of this sort of silly, fallacious. I mean, I remember Bear Stearns, one of the guys that worked there, he called me up and he's like, and I didn't know much. I was young, dumb. I just had no idea, but I still knew enough to go, this doesn't make sense. And they were like, well, you know, we can start doing stated income loans on commercial. When I first heard that, I'm like, stated income loans on commercial? You mean they're like, you're not going to look for any income? You're buying this $2 million building? Um, and oh, by the way, we're going to lend 90 some odd percent. And I just thought to myself, I'm like, something about this just seems really dumb. Um, and of course, not too long thereafter was when the whole thing just plummeted with Bear Stearns. So, you know, I think you just, you had uh, a lot of foolishness and greed and you know, and just mismanagement of of everybody. So everybody was to blame. I mean, if everybody always wants to say, well, it was one side. It's like, well, you know, you can't always say that the consumer is 100% the victim. <laughs> it's like, you do have some personal responsibility to say, I probably shouldn't do that because uh, it's not a good idea. You know, I mean, that's, 
you know, so you just have people have to be real careful not to like go so far one side and just say, well, now you did have a decision you had to make. And if you had any fiscal responsibility, you probably should have said this probably isn't a good idea. Um, you know, because I'm not, you know, I can't just borrow money as much as I want. So, you know, there is that balance. I mean, there is always going to be lopsided one way, but everybody was to blame to some degree. So, but yeah, it was a, it was a wonky time for sure. And uh, you'll see that anytime things heat up, heat up, heat up, heat up, heat up. I mean, it. you'll just start to go, okay, we're probably about to hit the skids because this just can't go on for too long. So uh, that's just my simple testing breed. If you're in a market and you just see it get red hot, money's flying around and people are getting stuff and everybody's making money. It's just, it's probably the time you kind of start to go, oh, okay, this is not good. So, um, so great question. Any other questions, comments? I was just going to kind of piggyback off of that and just ask like, so like what regulatory measures kind of went into place for the industry after the financial crisis? To well, Sarbane, of... Sarbane, Sarbane's Oxley, I mean, just, you know, obviously kicked in and then you have, you have, you know, all of the, it was probably more regulatory things for uh, the securities industry, right? Just for, yeah. um, you know, for rating agencies. Uh, they, they were the ones that needed to do a better job uh, of basically coming in and scrutinizing the loans. Uh, that's their job, you know, and um, because the person that's coming to buy him is depending a lot on that, not as much as they do anymore. I mean, a lot of these guys will do their own due diligence now and go look at the properties and send people out to review the loan documents and, you know, things like that. So all around, it just became much more heavily regulated. And uh, rightly so, you know, rightly so, unfortunately, sad, because we always try to make little government, but when you, <laughs> when you do stupid stuff, they have to kind of step in. So any other comments before I unpack some more? Aren't there still like so many arguments regarding like the, the reforms for the credit agencies has not been yet done properly and there could be another crisis because of them? In the market, uh, because of who again? Sorry, I didn't. The credit and credit rating agencies because they still do it for the money and because of yeah. the coming in. Yeah, you could definitely make the argument. I think you you know, but I I would say that from my and this is just from my vantage point, just because I'm 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 in it day after day. I would say that things have changed dramatically. Like I I'm not seeing. Like there's, it's it's a lot more difficult and it hasn't changed since 2008. Uh, it's just a state consistently challenging to get a loan across the board uh, because they just do so much more due diligence, so much research, so much backstop. And uh, I think, you know, I think, yeah. So I think, I think, I, I think someone could, but I think it's a, it's hard. It would be a harder argument because we just haven't seen the same thing happening. Um, if you're a person trying to get a mortgage, it's still very difficult to get a mortgage. Even if you have great credit and a lot of income, it's still hard. <laughs> uh, it's still a pain in the behind. It's just, they've made it really difficult to get a loan. Um, so part of me kind of goes, it's annoying. But the other part of you says it's probably a good thing that you have enough barriers so that not every Tom, Dick and Harry can go get a loan. You know, I mean, that's 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 not a bad thing uh, to stop, you know, uh, silliness from people that shouldn't get the money or shouldn't borrow the money uh, to do it. So I would say I just haven't seen anything. Uh, and I think that's good because what it does is it prevents uh foolishness you know from happening um so yeah so good good question any other comments or questions you guys are you guys are engaged i love it it's good it's a good topic now cmbs just so you know again it's typically for larger deals it's usually 10 million or higher okay you can go lower but typically speaking they're larger loans they're all non-recourse do you guys remember what non-recourse is okay no personal guarantees. 
right? Uh, and their 30 year amortizations, they're fixed for 10 years typically. Um, you know, it's going to be expensive to do the loan. You're going to pay probably 50 or $60,000 to get it done. That's just for legal and all this stuff. <clears throat> and so uh, it'll take you 60 days to close. Um, and, uh, you know, they only do really apartments, office, retail, industrial, self-storage, hotels. They don't do construction. Uh, they don't really do rehab. It's just existing income producing properties that are making money that they can lend money. And the reason people do them is they tend to go a little bit higher on the loan to value. It's generally speaking why people go with them because their pricing is not as competitive as a life insurance company. Um, but people say, well, I need the leverage. So they go with CNBS. Now that's not happening right now, but you know, it does in the normal market. And so, so it's CMBS is something, again, you should know about. Maybe you're interested in getting into that space. Uh, I would say it's definitely a fascinating space, but uh, keep your resume nice and shuffled off. So, because <laughs> uh, you can have a job one day and <clears throat> the next it's gone. Uh, so it's very, it's very volatile. Um. Let's just talk about hard money loans pretty quick. Uh, somebody want to take a shot at what a hard money loan is? Uh, you know, just what what do I mean when I'm talking about a hard money loan? Anybody? Anybody? I'll start calling on people if I don't uh, get it. Tate, you want to take a crack at it? Yeah, yes. I'm not gonna lie. I was pretty. I was pretty kind of confused when I was when I was going through. Um, my understanding was that. It was generally for property. And then on top of that, I could be way off here, but I was assuming that it was under like, like the loaner had the money. Like it's not money that was pulled from anywhere, but it was kind of like, like they were the financer. It's like a direct financer. Yeah. So a hard money lender uh, has, it's their own money <laughs> and they lend money to people who are, can't go get a loan from a bank or they don't want to. So it's somebody who needs to close fast. Uh, they maybe have really bad credit. Uh, maybe there's something really wonky with the deal. And so it's called a collateral-based loan. So they're not gonna spend a bunch of time looking at tax returns and financial statements and all this stuff. All they're doing is they're saying, what is this property worth if I had to go and fire sell it tomorrow? And if I had to fire sell it tomorrow, that's the price I think it's worth. And uh, I will lend you like 60, 65% against that. Okay. Uh, because they're just saying, I, you know, I don't care about your background, Tate. Uh, maybe I might want a credit report or something, make sure you haven't had fraud, but I'm just trying to lend against the asset. And if you pay me back, great. But if you don't, I don't mind owning it. So, um, so that's kind of how hard money works. Uh, it's a lucrative business. People can do well in it. I've personally lent money on hard money before. We have a, I always said the worst case is the best. We didn't ever want to own the property, but I said, if we had to take it back, that's fine by me. You know, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. And so they're higher interest rates. Someone's going to pay 10, 11, 15% and probably three or four points. So it's not cheap, um, but people do them. And uh, you know, it's all, people say, that's why would anybody do that? That's crazy. And the answer is because everything is relative. You know, if I need to buy this property and I'm going to make a lot of money, and, and I pay X and I'll make this, who cares, right? Like, it's just, it's like all a math game. And so people do that all the time. Plus some people do it just because they don't want the brain damage of going and getting a loan from a bank. So they just say, I'll just close fast, go get this, do it real quick. And then I'll refinance when I, when I have more time, okay? So that's what a hard money lender is. Does that make sense? Yes, I have a question though. 
uh for yeah. like you said like because in this hard money we are giving against the value of the property right and normally they lend out around 65 percent of it if tomorrow the person is not able to pay back or anything then basically the lender takes over the property at that case right so basically we take over the whole valuation right for just giving out 65 percent it's not like we are covering I, up we are only yeah. recovering we are taking over the whole value yeah yeah great question so let let's say Someone's purchasing something for a million bucks. Yeah. And let's say that the uh, appraisal comes in at a million five. It doesn't matter because they're going to say, well, I'm giving you the purchase price. This is what you need to think about an appraisal. Purchase price, value, whichever is less. Okay. So if the appraisal, if it was a million bucks and it came in appraised at 900,000, they would take the 900,000. So it's always the lesser of the two, value, purchase price, whichever is less. So now if I own it already and I'm going to refinance it, then I'm going to take whatever that I think that property is worth. Okay. Now, some hard money lenders will do valuations. Some will not. They'll do their own and they just kind of say, I think it's worth this. I pulled comps. I'm fine. Some people get a third party official appraisal. But generally speaking, they're going to go off of whatever they think the lower value is. Does that make sense? Um, so good, really good question. Um, not a whole lot there. We don't do a ton of them, but they're out there and uh, there's pros and cons. Um, it's just trickier because if someone's getting a hard money loan, I'm always like, what's wrong? <laughs> what do I need to know that I should know? Um, so we just are real careful about it. Um, I'm going to tell you about bridge loans. Okay. So bridge loans are a little bit more relevant. Uh, there's a ton of them. Uh, they lend money against investment property. So apartment office, retail, industrial storage, et cetera. And they do it to people who are buying the asset with the intention of uh, renovating, fixing it up, cleaning it up, leasing it up, and then lifting the value, okay? Because they basically either was vacant, maybe they bought a half vacant apartment complex that's run down and beat up, or they bought a uh, office building that's half vacant, or maybe they bought an apartment complex that's that's fully occupied, but the rents are like 500 bucks each below market, okay? And it's old and run down. And so they say, hey, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to lease it up. I'm going to go clean up these units, put in some, some uh, you know, new bathroom floor, and I'll put in some new Formica and put a new fridge and all this stuff. And then I'm going to lift the rents uh, all across the board. And then eventually I'll refinance you out or I'll sell it, okay? And so the bridge lender says, I will lend you, uh, you give me your whole budget. So the purchase price plus everything it's gonna cost you to renovate this property. So let's say that that's, you know, 7 million bucks for the purchase price and $3 million for the, for the improvements, okay? So now you got a $10 million total capitalization. And what they'll do is they'll say, we're gonna lend you 65 to 70% of that total bucket of money, okay? And the way they do that is they're gonna look at, because you're gonna do projections. So you have to project this out and say, well, we think it's gonna lease up for this, and then the expenses are gonna be this, and da, 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 da. And then they will reverse back and say, well, if the future value is, you know, 16 million, Okay, then I need to be at 55% of the future value, not to exceed 65% of the bucket of money today. Okay. And so what they'll do is they'll lend that money, close, do it for three years, 36 months. They'll do interest only payments. They'll build it into your budgets. You're not making payments every month. And then what it'll do is you'll draw down to do all those improvements and the loan starts to increase, okay? 
and you're leasing up and getting uh, you know, tenants in there, et cetera. And then eventually you're gonna go ahead and sell the building or refinance that lender out. So henceforth the term bridge, right? You're only doing it for a short period of time. And that loan is probably, I don't know, in today's environment, it's probably eight to 10%. It used to be maybe like five and a half to seven in the interest rate, okay? They'll charge you probably a point in and a point out. So two points. They're only gonna do $10 million loans or higher. And uh, um, they only that's the kind of the general gist of it. So comments, questions about that? Does that make sense? I have a question. Um, yeah. Sorry, I've been so quiet. I actually have been really, really sick. But uh, so I'm just observing everything. But my question was, you know how you said people buy apartments and like big buildings and stuff. Is that the same way? You know how many people buy houses, like they buy cheap houses and then flip it. So can this loan be used for that as well? If they want to, if they see a house like and like for a very low price and then they want to like, you know, fix the interior and then flip it. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the answer is generally no. That is its own category in of itself. Those are fix and flip lenders. So they'll go buy a house or two. And uh, and those are hard money lenders too. They'll say, hey, we'll lend you 90% or whatever it is, the value. And we'll do all your improvements and then you can flip it out. You know, uh, And so they'll typically do that but these guys do not. They just do large buildings, 10 million or higher. Uh, and so they don't really deal with like individual homes, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank Good you. Question. Hope you feel better, by the way. Um, so, so yeah, so that's a bridge lender. Okay. Just kind of, I'm trying to give you this little taste and see. That's why we do taste and see. Uh, and you know, and so, um, so it's good to know that. And the final thing is third-party reports. Third-party reports uh, are designed to, you know, it's an appraisal, a survey. You know, it's a phase one environmental report. Okay, ALTA survey. So all these reports are third-party done by third parties to give evaluation, to tell you if the property condition's in good shape, to tell you if there's any environmental issues. Um, so when you get, when someone buys a property, um, they have to get all these reports to make sure that the property is sound condition, not ready to fall down. You know, you're not buying a cesspool with stuff in there that all of a sudden has, you know, leaking, storage tanks underground that you're like, oh, oops, you know. Uh, and so that's why you pay for these reports to assure that you are in good shape and you're not buying something that's gonna, you know, just be a nightmare, you know, cause you could buy a property and not get a phase one report and all of a sudden, you know, you're stuck with something that you're gonna have to spend, you know, half a bill, you know, half a million dollars cleaning up the property because there's a bunch of uh, leaking storage tanks under there and and that's a big problem so people have to pay for these reports to assure that they're not getting themselves in over their head okay so um, not a whole lot to know there um you know it's it's just you know it's generally speaking pretty nominal it's like getting an appraisal uh, and things of that magnitude but you know that's really what what third party reports are. Okay. So, um, so basically, 